also with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, strengthen us to serve you with purified lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Ta say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, the gospel of the Lord. So I was driving down the road a couple of weeks ago, actually try, trying to get rather urgently to a cemetery, not, not one I usually frequent, but one that's out a ways. Um, if if uh, the largest town in our county is here, and then there's sort of a smaller town, a smaller town, and outside the like three degrees of smaller out there between two farms, there's this old country cemetery, and I was asked to go to be there for a, a committal service for a, a relative of a relative of a member. And um, because I thought I, had, I knew where I was going, because I'd been there, but it had been a long time, I'm driving down the road just sort of trying to do this by memory, and as I'm going along, it occurs to me, I, I think I missed my turn. I, I think I should have turned left instead of going straight, and I, I think I, I, I missed my chance. So I'm driving along this, you know, pretty sparsely populated state route and leaving the outskirts of what was the smallest of several levels of towns on my journey and realized there wasn't anybody else around that I could ask. And more importantly, I was looking for a place I could turn around because while the, uh, <laughs> the road wasn't heavy with rush hour traffic, there was at least enough of the occasional coal truck or uh, passerby that I couldn't just sort of casually turn around in the middle of things. So I'm looking, I'm driving, I'm driving, looking for a suitable place away from any intersections, away from any place where other cars might be coming around, looking for a place where I could finally get things straightened out, where I could finally turn around. 
And it occurred to me that the people who were waiting for me, as soon as I got there, I could explain to them, I'm sorry that I'm late, I'm sorry that things are running behind, I'm sorry I got turned around, I got lost. And, and these are graceful, good, good, kind folks. They would be gracious and forgiving to me, but I couldn't get through to them because I was now far out down this road with no cell service that I couldn't even communicate with them and say, I'm really, really sorry that I'm running late. I'm really, really sorry that I got lost. I knew waiting for me was the possibility of them saying, it's all right, it's fine, thank you for coming, but, but I needed to find a way to get through them. What I was looking for, what would make it possible, was a place where I could finally turn around. And what do you know, eventually there came this sort of crossroad where I could turn around, pull in off the, the, the main road, and then get myself turned around and find my way back. Long story short, I eventually got where I was headed. The people were fantastic and graceful and said, oh yes, we understand, I, and they, they bore with me. Poor, poor guy that I was. They, they pitied me that I'd made the wrong turn and, and everything was fine. There was grace indeed for me waiting as soon as I arrived. But what I most deeply needed was a place to turn around. And it wasn't a fearful thing to turn around. It was finally a relief of, I know things are pointed in the wrong direction. I know I'm not going where I'm supposed to. I want a place where I can finally turn around. That's the scene, honestly, when a guy named John makes his public debut. I, I know we sometimes have a really hard time, especially we Christians, we, we folks who like to focus on Jesus, who seems so kind and loving and gracious and, and I hope relatable. We have a hard time making sense of this guy named John because he seems like none of those things. He's brash and he's loud and he's sort of stark and he doesn't seem to have a whole lot of like a comfort factor to him. He just seems like this strange weirdo, like, like the person you see, you know, on the street corner in all the TV shows or, or in the, the big city wearing the, you know, the, 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 the sandwich board sign or the holding the, the cardboard placard saying the end is near. John's sort of one of these gruff, strange, surprising, startling figures. And, and he seems to be talking about knocking stuff down and turning things around and, and we're wanting to hear the, the news of God's love and, and all that. It, it's hard to make sense of John and why anybody would think he's a person you want to introduce your story of. I mean, we just heard the opening words of Mark's gospel. Mark doesn't give us any Christmas story. There's no sentimental manger or angels or shepherd. There's not even the magi following the star. There's none of that. We don't get any of the birth of cute baby Jesus. Mark just starts right off with, Here's the good news of Jesus, and bam, we're off to the races with John the Baptizer as the startling figure who went out to the middle of nowhere, and people started flocking to him, and he announced the possibility of turning around, and that's, that's the key. In the world and in the time in which John lived, man, people just felt stuck. I mean, people sort of felt like they were stuck with the world that they'd been handed. And in a lot of ways, it was an unpleasant place or a way to live because there were the Romans sort of occupying all their public reality with this sort of arrogant, boastful Caesar barking decrees from back at the Capitol and everybody else tr just trying to get through their lives without the next inconvenience or the next trouble that Caesar caused by barking some new decree, whether it was, you know, go to your hometowns for a census, like in the way Luke tells it, or marching more soldiers through the streets to make a public example of anybody they thought was a troublemaker or taking their money in taxes. Nobody liked that the Romans were around and powerful. And for a lot of folks, they, they, I'm just going to try and keep my head down and do the best I can to sort of get through life. There were religious folks who said, well, the way to sort of just get, you, the, the, get your, your way through life on your own is follow the rules as well as possible, even if it uh, makes you unable to associate with other people, even if it means you can't hang out with the sinners, even if it means you don't focus on the needs of others, you just sort of worry about you and your own personal private holiness. There were others in uh, John's day who just sort of made peace with, we're going to collaborate with the Romans, and yeah, they're crooked, and yeah, it's not really good, and yeah, Caesar are terrible, but... It, it's sort of easier for us to play along with him and just be quiet about all the terrible things that Caesar does. The, these folks sort of said, you got to make the best of life you can. It's going to be miserable. You're going to feel like you're selling out, but do it anyway because that's the only way to get by. Everybody felt stuck, to be honest. And, and for a lot of folks, they, they didn't even want to admit it. It was just sort of, well, this is what life is. Life is terrible and miserable, and the Romans are around, and the religious people just make me feel rotten, um, and I, I guess I'm just going to have to look out for myself and sort of fend for myself as well as I can in life. And 
There were others who felt like something is really, really wrong, but I just don't know how to make things right again. It, it wasn't even people who had like these terrible, grievous sins, um, you know, people who were the notorious sinners, but just like everyday life, it just felt like something was rotten and nobody knew a way for things to be made right again. It, it, it was like everybody felt like we're all headed the wrong direction. Is, is nobody paying attention? We're driving down the, 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 the road. We missed our turn. We've gone the wrong way and we're looking for a place to turn around. And if you've ever been in that spot where you're driving along knowing you're headed in the wrong direction and the thing you want most deeply in that moment is I want a place to turn around. That's, that's what made John such a powerful figure. What he said was right where you are, just as you are, it is possible to turn around. In fact, not just you individually, but it's possible for all of us to turn things around and to live in a new way that God is bringing right now. That was good news. It meant that Rome wasn't going to last forever. It meant that Caesar didn't really call the shots. It meant that the religious respectable people who sort of just like to look down on everybody else who wasn't as good as them, that they didn't have the final say on what God wanted. And it meant that the people who sort of sold their souls to partner with Rome, that they didn't have the final say on things, that God was really doing something new and you really could be free from the old ways you've been stuck. So John invited people to come and meet him out in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, like uh, Mark, our gospel writer, says. And there, there's a reason for that. There's a couple of reasons, honestly. One, wilderness is sort of one of those like, important sort of images or moments in Israel's past, right? It's that, that, sort of, that, that sort of crucible time in Israel's past where they went to get clarity, where, where the, the freed Israelites, when they'd been freed from slavery in Pharaoh's Egypt, went before they were able to go into the promised land. It was a place to learn, sort of getting everything else stripped away and being able to focus on how are we going to live as God's people? So the wilderness is sort of that place. It's sort of like a looking back. Let, let's get back to basics. Let's get back to that, that past time in our, in our faith history when there weren't all these other distractions and all these other terrible things. We, we, we can go back there and start over again. And it sort of called to mind the old end of the exile time too when the people had been carried into Babylon and prophets like the voice we heard from Isaiah said God's going to make a whole new way and, and, and there's going to be a whole new pathway even in the wilderness. There's no official highways and there's no roads or, or street signs or markers but God's going to create a new path and God's going to straighten out what's crooked and prepare a highway, not just for God, God doesn't need a road, but for the people of God to be led out of exile and to come home. Wilderness was the place that happened. It was this sort of image, this idea of being led back into a good place, back into closeness, back into things being right again, things not feeling like everything is terrible. That's what John offered. He said, God, after so much waiting and so much time, God was making it possible. God was going to do a new thing. And so come out, meet me out in the wilderness. We're going to start over again. And, and, and if you went out to John and you got baptized, and sort of dunked in the River Jordan and brought back up, it didn't have all quite the layers of meaning that, that uh, we have in church life as, as Christians when we talk about being joined to Jesus' death and resurrection. Obviously, that, that they, they weren't there yet. Jesus, Jesus isn't on the scene yet. But John used this, this image of being brought under the water and brought back up. Okay, here's your turning point. Here's that spot in the road where you were turning the wrong direction and you can turn things around again. And finally, we can get straightened out and head in a direction that's aligned with God's priorities of justice, of mercy, of compassion, of decency, of truth telling. All the things that feel rotten about living with, with Caesar barking crazy stuff in the background and, and the respectable religious people, on the other hand, all the things that felt wrong and rotten about that, John says there's a new possibility. God's about to bring it, and you can be a part of it now. It was like knowing there was forgiveness waiting at the cemetery when I was going to arrive, but I need to get myself turned around to get there. And all the, all the ways that I'd gotten myself lost and gotten astray, those could be set aside and forgiven, but I needed to find a place I could turn around. That's what John's ministry was. It was to say to folks who felt like they knew things were broken and they didn't know how to say it. They didn't know how to put it into words. They didn't even know how they could turn around again. John said, here it is, right where you are. Just come and meet me out here in the middle of nowhere. You don't need anything else. No other distractions are necessary. No other rituals required. Come here. Let this be your turning point to start over again. 
that's really what repentance is all about. We, we've turned it into a churchy word. We've turned it into this, this religious formula that you have to say a certain prayer, or you have to do this ritual, or, or do this act in order to you know, like get your, your, your points reinstated with God. That, that's not what it's like. It's, it's like being on the road and knowing you're turned the wrong direction, and the further you continue, you are getting yourself further and further from a good direction, and you're just aching for a place to turn around where you know there will be welcome when you get there. And even the chance to turn around feels like grace. It feels sometimes, maybe living in this moment of our lives, like there's a lot that feels rotten. And, and maybe part of the problem is we don't know how for things not to be rotten. It, 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 it feels like it, nothing feels like it, it's quite in the right place. Nothing feels quite subtle, like, like, some, like, like something isn't catching the right gear sometimes. But maybe we're feeling like, ah, how do we even let change happen? How, how, do, how, do we, how do we let our lives be reflective of the goodness of God's reign? And there's so much that feels like it is rotten and broken. There, there's, there's so much that feels out of sorts as we live day by day through a pandemic. There's so much that feels rotten when we see sort of moments where people could be kind and compassionate toward others and instead they sort of come off as just being self-centered and only focused on their own convenience. And it's, it's hard for us to even deal with, with, with mending relationships in a time when we can feel so strained. It feels like things are broken and how can things be put right again. John's message comes to us too and says there's a new thing God is doing and we can be a part of it now. It, it feels weird to say something can be new even though John was announcing it 2,000 years ago, but it's more the sense of there's always an opportunity for God's reign to break into this moment, this space, this time. And there's not a ritual you have to master, there's not a quest you have to go on, there's not a thing you have to do to, to impress God to make that possible. It's just Hearing John say, right here's a place you can turn around. Here's a place you can pull over by the side of the road. Get yourself turned around. And all the ways in our lives we've been turned away from God's reign, all the ways that we've been turned away from God's goodness and justice and mercy, all the ways we've been turned in, bent in ourselves on sort of me and my group first, or things that I think are most important, I'm not going to care about my neighbor, all, all those ways we get bent in on ourselves and basically turned the wrong direction. John's message comes to us too and says, it's possible right here and now to be turned around in a new direction. And it's more than just our willpower. See, this is the other thing. John doesn't just say, try my new self-help program and buy, buy my book. And uh, by the time you get to the end of it, you can turn yourself into a better person. John knows it's not just get the act of getting dunked in the water in the river that brings change. God's about to do something new. And in Jesus, it is possible. In Jesus, something has begun, and we've been brought into this new movement that Jesus has begun that makes a new direction possible for all of us in, in little ways and in big ways as individuals, as family, as community, as, as, a, as a whole world full of people. It is possible in this moment, in this place, to get pulled off, headed in the wrong direction, and turned in a new way that aligns with the things that matter to God, justice and mercy, kindness for those who are most vulnerable. Respect and decency and beauty and truth. What the kingdom of God is all about, it's possible for us to begin to live in that now because Jesus has come to make it possible. The good news that John offers isn't if you work hard enough on yourself with, with you know, self-help or the, the, the right steps to work on yourself, you can become a better person. It's Right here and now, God's breaking in and making a U-turn possible. So where we feel like we were turned in the wrong direction, in, in little patterns of selfishness, in, in the, the addictions and things that we get ourselves hung up on, in the ways we sort of get casually more and more used to being rotten or self-centered or hateful toward other people, all those things we can be turned from. There's a spot to turn around right now. And John offers it to us because he says Jesus is coming. And Jesus' presence makes turning possible. If you've ever been in one of those points in life when you feel like you're headed in the wrong direction or things are wrong and you don't know how to put it into words or don't, know, don't even know how to make things right again, if you've ever been in that spot, then you know it is good news to hear somebody say, here's a place to turn around. Here's a place we can finally get headed back in the right direction again. So for all the ways that John is a startling and strange and difficult character for us to wrap our brains around or open our hearts up to, maybe exactly what we need is somebody like him 
who, who likes seeing a road sign on the side of the road that's saying U-turns are now possible, maybe that's exactly what we need is the refreshing good news that when we've been pointed in the wrong direction, big ways or little ways, dramatic ways or just sort of subtle, slow, day-by-day -day ways that things aren't right, it's possible to turn in a new direction. Jesus makes that possible. His coming enables us to be pulled in a new direction. And it's not a matter of being afraid that Jesus is going to zap us for all the ways we've messed up or gotten ourselves lost. As we get ourselves turned around, as Jesus makes it possible for us to be turned around, there is instant grace and forgiveness. But when you find yourself lost, you just want to get yourself turned in a good direction, Jesus makes it possible now. You don't have to wait for any other moment or time. You don't have to wait till Christmas Eve at midnight. You don't have to wait until some other milestone in your life right here and now. Whatever you're doing, this is a moment for all the ways that we feel things aren't right to get turned around again, to be led in a new direction that resonates, that fits with the character of God. Today is the moment we can be turned in a new way. Dear sisters and brothers, that's good news. Amen. Together let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who, if the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In hope and expectation, let us pray for restoration and peace, for light and life, for our needs, and for those of the world God so loves. Each part of our prayers today will end with the words, Stir up your power, O God, and you're invited to respond, Stir up your power and come. Let's pray. Prepare the way for the people of every language, tribe, and nation, O God, and comfort them with your compassion through leaders whose hearts are set on your ways of truth, righteousness, and justice. Stir up your power, O God. Stir up your power and come. Prepare the way for your church, O God. Like John the baptizer, enable us to fearlessly yet humbly announce the coming of your Son, to point beyond ourselves to your reign of goodness, of justice, and of mercy, who will feed his flock like a shepherd. Stir up your power, O God. Stir up your power and come. Prepare the way for all creation, O God, that every element be infused with your care, and that through our care for concern for all you have made, we might be good stewards of all that you have created. Stir up your power, O God. Stir up your power and come. Prepare the way for the weak and elderly, O God, and through us be their tender strength and comforting courage. Protect those most vulnerable to sickness, those who work on the front lines, those who work in hospitals and nursing care facilities, those who work in laboratories developing and testing cures, medicines, and vaccines, those who find themselves in harm's way, and those who are most at risk for sickness. Enable all those who are separated and isolated from others to know that they are not forgotten and enable us to find creative ways to reach out to all people with your love. Stir up your power, O oh God. Stir up your power and come. Prepare the way for our church families, O oh God, that we would lift up our voices in strength and faithfully witness to your word of favor, pardon, and peace for all people. Give us strength and endurance to get through difficult days. Give us courage to love, and give us the grace also to be patient in the waiting. Stir up your power, O God. Stir up your power and come. Prepare the way for the communion of saints to come more fully to realization through us and among us. Help us to trust your promise that we will be gathered together in your new creation with all those who have gone before us, who are at rest in you. Inspire us by their examples and their faith that we may walk faithfully on the way you have prepared for us, that we might together Reflect your light into the world. Stir up your power, O God. Stir up your power and come. We trust that you are with us, O God, and our spirits rejoice in your goodness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.